I love cooking, I love teaching people how to cook. I've been doing both for 30 years. To cook well, it helps if you love and value food, as that's where it all starts. My approach to cooking is simple and not new. Use the best ingredients you can get, get organized, and follow the recipe. And that way, you'll be sure to get really wonderful results. Soups are one of those things for which there seems to be an almost infinite number of variations. They can be ambrosial, a smooth puree, as thin as water and sparklingly clear, or so thick you can stand a spoon up in them. They can be a great collection of ingredients with beans and pulses rubbing shoulders with vegetables, all in a tangle of noodles and spaghetti, and topped off with a blob of some oily, herby relish. In the case of the soup I'm about to show you, they can be made with a minimum amount of ingredients potatoes, onions, and some good stock. I'm going to get my potatoes and my onion on sweating for the potato soup. So I've peeled my potatoes and diced them, and it doesn't matter if they're slightly uneven here, because this is going to be a pureed soup. You can hear my butter is melting and foaming in here in the pan. And I've got my onions, again, not very evenly sliced or diced. That's fine. So. Pop those in, you hear the butter foaming, that's the key. Never put vegetables into cold butter or cold oil when you're starting to sweat them like this. It's a nice sprinkle of salt, some pepper. Today I'm serving the soup with black pudding and lovely green oily parsley pesto. So coat the vegetables well in the butter. You could use olive oil here as well, which would be really nice. That's lovely. And then, because we're sweating, it's going to be a low heat tight-fitting lid and an extra layer of insulation. Butter wrapper, parchment paper, greaseproof, whatever it takes. So pop that in. Amazing the difference putting in the little layer of paper it does in terms of keeping in the steam. Then lid on. I just want the vegetables to collapse. It takes about 10 minutes or so. Turn your heat nice and low. So while that's happening, I can make the pesto. And I'm using flat parsley. You can, of course, use curly parsley. This is sometimes referred to as Italian parsley. I just like to use the leaves and then the stalks. You can keep your stock pot or put them on the compost heap, whatever works for you. I like to give the parsley just a little coarse chop before I put it into my blender, just to start the process off. So put your green, whatever it happens to be, into your little blender. A little bit of garlic. I'll just cut the garlic in half like that. And then some pine nuts. Pine nuts or pine kernels are sometimes called. So pop those in. A nice pinch of salt, just to lift the flavour of everything. And then my olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil is what I like to use. And I've got some parmesan. But usually I whiz this up first and then put the parmesan on just um, a little bit later. Brilliant. I've got a lovely paste like that. I'm going to add in my parmesan. And then I usually just blend in the parmesan by hand. It hasn't blended in all that so well because it was a little bit coarsely grated. That's fine. So I will give it a little further buzz. That should do it, just to break it up. Now, I need to taste it just to make sure the seasoning is good. This nice balance of sweet parmesan, sort of dry green parsley. Garlic, mm, really nice. Very, very fresh tasting. And then we're going to need to look back at our soup and see how that's doing. Lovely, look how gorgeous and green and deep in color it is. So take off the lid, see lots of steam coming out of the pan. That's a good sign that we've trapped the steam in the saucepan and it will help to prevent our vegetables from burning. And they're just sort of starting to sort of wilt. This stage of the process, the 10 minutes of sweating approximately, it sets the flavor deeply in the soup. So now I can add in my stock. You can add in cold stock, but I've heated my stock for two reasons. One, obviously, it speeds up the process, but actually, because the soup cooks more quickly, you get a fresher, cleaner flavour at the end. Give it a little stir again. Now you can turn up the heat and let it simmer properly. So we want to cook it until the potatoes and the onions are completely soft and tender. Put the lid back on the saucepan, because if you cook it without the lid, what you'll find is the stock may evaporate and your soup may end up too thick. So the final remaining ingredient for serving with the soup is the black pudding. Cut the black pudding fairly thickly, so it's about one inch, two centimetres thick like that. Melt some butter in a frying pan and then 
pop them in. I like to let the black pudding cook nice and gently for about 10 minutes so it doesn't get too crusty and hard on the outside. You do it the way you like it, but I think it tastes better when it sort of yields with the spoon rather than actually, you're not supposed to have to saw black pudding. It was never about that. So the black pudding has been cooking away very gently for about 10 minutes. So I'm gonna turn off the heat because I'm sure these are ready. Yep, they are. They're heated through. So I'm just gonna take them off the direct heat of the pan just for a moment. I'll stack them up there like that and then they'll just keep hot because I do want those hot going into the soup. Okay, let's go back to the soup itself. So what we need to be sure at this stage is that our potatoes and onions are completely soft. Take a bit out on a spoon and just press it like that. You see the way the potato just disappears completely. You know that the potato is completely soft, so it'll render to a smooth puree. So the potatoes and onions are completely cooked. I'm just going to blend the soup. I'm after a really lovely, smooth, silky consistency. So again, taking the very easily available potato and elevating it just to a different level. Now that's a lovely, smooth consistency. It's a little bit, a tiny little bit thick, so I'm going to add in a little milk it could be creamy milk, it could be chicken stock. Okay, that's really lovely and smooth and silky, which is exactly the way I want it. And I just need to taste it. So checking for seasoning at this stage. That's really delicious. It doesn't need anything else. Another day, it might need a little more salt and pepper. So at this stage, we're ready to serve. So nice hot soup bowls. Nice bread and butter to serve with us. I've got some sourdough bread, it could be soda bread, whatever it is that you happen to like in your house. And then a little of our black pudding. And then finally, a little of the parsley pesto. So that's really nutritious, full of different flavors and textures. It's almost actually a meal in itself. When choosing beef, the ideal is that the meat has been hung to dry age for a minimum of three weeks. The ultimate cut of beef for roasting is the prime rib or fore rib, which has a nice coating of fat on it. For this recipe, I'm using the fillet, the most tender part of the animal, and that's generally trimmed of all its inedible tough gristle before cooking. The sauce, dressing and salad leaves can all be prepared in advance, so the final assembly is pretty straightforward. The tingling tastes in this dish are both delicious and refreshing. So I've been roasting the peanuts in the oven just until they get quite a nice toasted colour and until the skins start to lift. And yeah, these look perfect. One of the great things about this recipe, the peanut sauce, is that you don't actually have to peel the skins off the peanuts, which is fantastic. But you can see the way the skins have actually started to lift, but they'll give a lovely little fleck in the actual sauce. They need to cool a little bit before I make the sauce. While they're cooling, I'm going to get my beef on grilling. So I've got a grill pan on, just heating up. It could be a roasting tin as well if you want to, a heavy roasting tin. So I have a beautiful piece of fillet of beef. This is a very precious, very expensive ingredient. You can see the way it's beautifully marbled in there. So simply put a little bit of olive oil onto the surface of the meat, not onto the grill pan. Make sure your grill pan is really nice and hot or your roasting tin before you put it on. And then just do that. And as soon as you hear the sizzle, you can happily drop it onto the grill pan. Now I can make the dressing while the beef is cooking. I will be keeping an eye on the beef to build up a nice bit of color, but not too much. The dressing ingredients are very straightforward. It's classic Asian dressing sort of combination of flavors. I've got some finely chopped red chili and I'm putting them straight into a jam jar. So later on, I'll be able to shake the jam jar just to mix up all the ingredients really nicely. Some lovely sharp, slightly astringent ginger, which gives that lovely fresh kind of tantalizing flavor at the end. That goes in nice and finely chopped because you're going to be eating these ingredients raw. Some chopped garlic, chopped rather than crushed, but finely chopped. And then one and a half teaspoons of this dark, soft brown sugar, which is going to blend into the other dressing ingredients. And then my liquid ingredients are some toasted sesame oil, one tablespoon of this, two tablespoons of white wine vinegar, or you could use lime juice here as well if you wanted to. And again, as always when I'm making a dressing, regardless of what part of the world it comes from, if it involves oil and vinegar, I always like to measure it to get the proportion correct. Let's just have a little look back at our beef. 
So let's just turn it over. Yeah, get beautiful grill marks on it there like that. So everything in there except a good generous twist of pepper. And you might think it's funny to be cutting the hot pepper in with the chili, but they're slightly different types of heat. And as you can see, this makes a sort of a thickish dressing. It's not like a classic pouring French vinaigrette. This will keep in your fridge perfectly for several days. So if you didn't use it all, you know, the, when you're making this salad, don't waste it. Keep it and put it over a little bit of cold roast chicken or something like that. I'll be able to give that a shake up later on. And because it's not so thin, it clings to the leaves quite nicely. Now, back to the beef. Yeah, more lovely colour and just the final side there. So at this point, I can season the beef with a little salt and pepper. This will cook really nicely in the oven. 15 to 20 minutes, the beef will roast away there and we'll cook it to our satisfaction. In my case, that's sort of medium, medium rare, that sort of thing. Now, the next thing I can do is make the peanut sauce. So. I have little cumin seed just roasting lightly in the pan just to bring out the lovely flavour to add a nutty tone to that flavour, releasing the essential oils and so on. I'm going to give those a little coarse grind and they add a slightly smoky flavour to the peanut sauce. They don't have to be ground to an absolute powder. I like when there's a little perceptible bits of texture and that extra hit of flavour you sometimes get from the slightly larger pieces. So that goes in to our little blender. Our peanuts, terrific that we don't have to peel them. This sauce is really delicious as well uh, with some grilled chicken. It's kind of similar to a satay sauce really and we'll keep in the fridge for a couple of days. Water, about four tablespoons of water. One tablespoon of sunflower oil or peanut oil as well if you want. So I'm going to just blend it up a little before I add in the chicken stock and then I add in enough chicken stock to give me a sort of a pouring, thick-ish consistency. Now at this stage, it's really thick. Okay, so this is not a sauce by any stretch of the imagination at this stage. It's more like a butter or a puree. So the chicken stock will loosen this. Give us another puree. You can see the little flecks of the peanut skins in there. That's perfect consistency. So I need to taste because I haven't added in any salt there yet. And it tastes absolutely bland because of the lack of salt. There's, there's flavour in there, but it's just not absolutely delicious. Let's just give that a mix. Another taste. Mm, transformation. So it just lifts the flavour of all the ingredients in there. That's that. If you're making it head, put it into a jam jar, into the fridge and so on. I'm going to decant it into a little bowl and it's pretty much ready to serve. Great. The beef should pretty much be ready at this stage. Oh yeah, it looks great. Lots of colour. I'm going to take that out. And at this point, it feels sort of slightly firm to the touch like that. Almost a sort of a marshmallow texture. Should be lovely rare to medium rare in there. So when you're resting it, put an upturned plate in a larger plate. So any juices that run out of the beef will save, of course, but the meat will not be sitting or stewing in its own juices. And then I'm going to turn the oven down between 50 and 100 degrees to keep the beef warm rather than keeping it hot, because if you keep it hot, it may cook on a little more. So the beef has been resting in the oven for about 15 minutes. My salad leaves are ready, washed, dried. My Asian dressing, give it a good stir up. The uh, red chilli looks really pretty against the green leaves. Nice big bowl to mix it. You could do individual plates, but I like because it's a fillet of beef and, you know, a fillet of beef is nearly always a celebration. Do it family style and then the whole dish will come to the table. Some mint and coriander leaves for freshness. Now I can arrange my beef around the salad, neither too thick nor too thin. I have one little piece at the end. What I'm going to do with this is, this could be your surprise that nobody knows about in there. And you come across that then when you want it. Our peanut sauce, put a little of the sauce on each piece of beef and then serve the rest separately so people can have little or more as they see fit. And then finally, a little shower of scallions on top. 
then straight to the table with that while the beef is still slightly warm. All of the flavors and textures of the leaves and scallions are nice and crisp. Asian dressing is still punchy with heat and the peanut sauce is still full of flavor and nice and cool. It's a really, really nice, well-balanced, lovely way to eat. cooked in a thin syrup is known as a compote. The technique sounds and indeed is quite simple, but there are subtleties. There is a considerable difference between a compote of rhubarb and stewed rhubarb. So it's a compote of rhubarb with clementine juice and vanilla that I'm going to show you next. To serve with the compote, some crisp, golden, caramelized and elegant biscuits made with puff pastry and icing sugar. And they look and taste like something you would find in a French patisserie. Never a bad thing. I'm going to cook the rhubarb really simply, which is the way I like to prepare the first few precious stalks of rhubarb of the season. I'm just going to cut them into about five centimetre lengths. You don't need to get out your ruler, but the more evenly cut the rhubarb is, the more evenly it cooks. So into a baking dish, something that's oven proof, I like to serve the rhubarb in the dish I cook it in. That way, I don't have to move it around too much and it looks really beautiful when it comes to the table. I'm combining another flavour with the rhubarb and that is citrus fruit, specifically clementine juice. So a little clementine, which is a member of the large satsuma family, small oranges, and that works brilliantly. But the other citrus fruit, which is in season just as the rhubarb starts to appear, is something I'm really, really fond of and that's a blood orange. The citrus fruit from the orange family absolutely loves the rhubarb. Blood orange is one of my favourite ingredients for the season. I use them in lots and lots of sweet and savoury situations, full of all sorts of goodness, we are told to believe. Squeeze that in, and then a little of the clementine juice as well, enough to make up our quantity. And the two work really nicely together. When the rhubarb is cooking, it also throws out a little of its own juice. So this will end up looking nice and juicy at the end of cooking. OK, so that's my citrus fruit juice using a sieve just to make sure I don't get any pips in there. Now, a couple of more things to go in there, just two more things, a vanilla pod. So the vanilla will scent the rhubarb beautifully and it goes fabulously well with oranges. So I like to push that right down in underneath the rhubarb, right down to the bottom of the dish and it perfumes all the way through, it's really fantastic. And finally, just a little sugar. Depending on the variety of a rhubarb you're using, it can take less or more sugar. So I usually err on the side of being scant with the sugar, but I don't want this to be an exercise in wincing when I'm eating it. I want it to taste absolutely delicious. So that's basically all there is. We're going to bake this in the oven. So very little liquid in there at this stage. So I've got some parchment paper. You could use greaseproof paper here. And I've just run it under the tap. You can see it's got little, lovely little sort of bubbles of water still on it and I'm going to cover with this. You can use tin foil or aluminium foil if you like, but I prefer to use the parchment paper, dampen down like that, squeeze that to get rid of most of the water, and then I just mould it over the dish like that. And that will keep in plenty of the steam that's coming out of the rhubarb and help that steam to circulate underneath this little cap on top and cook it out beautifully and tenderly. Then into our oven, cook it for between 30 and 40 minutes. So now I'm going to uh, make the sugar biscuits to serve with the rhubarb. For these biscuits, I'm using puff pastry and icing sugar, and I want a richly caramelized, thin, crisp, sort of cracking biscuit. Cracking in the sense that it cracks when you bite into it, and cracking in the sense that it should also be good. So I've got some sugar, icing sugar, or what you'd call confectioner sugar in America, and some puff pastry. I'm using some puff pastry that I make myself, if you're not making your own puff pastry and if you're going to buy it for this, I suggest strongly that you use butter-only puff pastry because if you want the flavour of puff pastry and the delicious flakiness that you associate with puff pastry, butter is your only man here. OK, so these are funny little biscuits. I serve these with all sorts of things, with ice creams, sorbets, fruit salads, just with a great cup of coffee or a cup of tea. Instead of using flour to roll the pastry, I use icing sugar. Take your piece of pastry and also dust that. And I'm going to roll it out into a rectangle. Now, there are little French biscuits called palmier, 
or elephant's ears, which most people will be familiar with. And the technique I use for making these biscuits is exactly the same technique you use when you're making palmier. So we'll have a little look at that as we go along. You can turn it over to get a bit more sugar. I know I'm using a lot of sugar here. You need to use a lot of sugar to get the caramel. But when we're cooking them then, we cook them until they're really quite dark. So we cut through some of that sweetness. And this, these aren't something you'd have every day. So roll it into a rectangle, and that's pretty good like that. A little more icing sugar, or if you're feeling economical, gather up some of that and push it in there. I usually just fold the pastry in half like that, and that gives me my center point. And then I fold the pastry halfway towards the center point, or there, thereabouts, and I do it from both sides. And again, so this time it's almost hitting that center line there and there. This is exactly what you do when you're making palmier. Then we gather up some of that sugar like that, okay, and then fold that on top of that. So now what we have, just layers of pastry, folded up like that. And if you were making palmier, what you would do is you'd take a piece of that and you put it onto your baking tray like that. And then they spread out and you get what's known as an elephant ear. We're not making palmier, we're making these long, thin sugar biscuits. So grab your little palmier-shaped raw biscuit and pinch it together. Now at various different stages while you're doing this, you think this isn't going to work, but keep at it, it will. And then I'm just going to roll it out. So when you start to roll it, you see the way it starts to separate. Then pinch it and push it back down, because we're after a long sort of slipper shape. Keep turning it in the sugar. Gradually, it rolls into a lovely thin sort of slipper, and that's it. Very thin, sugar encrusted, and then straight onto a baking sheet, and on with the next one. So these are now going into a hot preheated oven and I need them to cook for about eight minutes on one side to caramelize, then we'll turn them over and caramelize them on the other side. Oh yeah, these are just perfect. Lots of lovely color, which is what I really, really like. Like that. So, Straight away, just take them off the tray. Don't use your fingers, because they're going to be sticky and sugary and slightly caramelly. They will crisp up even a little bit further. So our rhubarb must be really beautiful and tender, but hopefully not collapsed. Now, ah, oh yeah, this looks really, really great. So I'm taking it in skewer, you could use a small little knife, and just Push it into the fruit, you see it's completely tender, but still holding its shape. And look how much delicious juice there is that the rhubarb has thrown out itself, because there was virtually no sign of any juice in the dish when we put this into the oven. If you want at this stage, you can fish out the vanilla, because you certainly don't want to eat that, but that will have perfumed the rhubarb really beautifully. Once the rhubarb has cooled in about 15 minutes, we'll put our biscuits on a lovely serving dish, warm rhubarb, icy cold softly whipped cream or yogurt, very simple food, Seasonal, really delicious. I'm excited to taste this. Mm -hmm.